All right, I guess we're good. Uh, welcome to all my online friends. Thank you for joining us. You know, as I thought about the Easter season, we celebrated last Sunday what hopefully every evangelical church on the planet celebrated, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion led to the empty tomb, and because that tomb's empty, everything is different. Now we have hope and love and peace and truth because of the resurrection of our Lord. Without the resurrection, Paul said, there is no faith. Take away the resurrection and our faith is futile and so is our preaching, he wrote there in 1 Corinthians 15. So Jesus is alive now and he appears to his disciples and to others for some 40 days. And then as he ascends to heaven, he tells them, and you shall be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utter ends of the world. And so they are now assigned, as we are, to share this good news. Well, in order to have good news, we must first have bad news, right? Have something to compare it to. So this good news is the gospel. The gospel is a word that means good news. It's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is. It's that wonderful story of God's conquering sin through his son. So what I want to do tonight is look at a specific passage of scripture out of Paul's letter to the Galatians. Now I preached this sermon, I don't know, I think a couple of years ago. Um, so I went back and modified a little bit of it to be able to uh, re-preach it or teach it this evening. Now the reason I have this graphic up here of Bewitched is because that's taken from the actual passage. So let me talk about this thing called saved. <clears throat> Often I've told people I was saved on an Easter Sunday. I mentioned that in the early service this past week. You hear people talk about, yeah, I got saved. Um, when I worked at Abilene National Bank as a motor bank teller, oh man, back in the early 80s, then I was just a kid. But we're all in that motor bank and everybody can hear whoever is in your lane when you begin to talk to them. Um, you don't have an earpiece or anything. It's a speaker and everyone can hear it. And my uh, friend of mine pulled up and I don't know if he was cashing a check or whatever, but he said, hey man, did you hear about so-and-so? He got saved. And one of my colleagues, people I was working with said, what does that mean? What does saved mean? Well, the same question is asked today, and so I want to help us understand just from the very beginning what this all means and what is required of us to be saved. So in John chapter 10, verse 9, we see how the Bible actually uses that phrase, saved. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. In Acts 2, 21, Peter preached, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved saved. Now there are a number of directions. I could actually go with this. We could talk about how once we're saved, we're always saved. We can't be unsaved. We did nothing to earn it. We can't unearn it either. But I want to um, get into the specifics of what's required for salvation. The question is often asked, is someone saved by faith alone or by faith plus works? We used to ask the common questions, and I still do from time to time. In fact, I shared this with someone just in recent weeks. If you died today, are you sure you'd go to heaven? Well, because many people identify as a Christian, even though that word Christian can be defined as completely different things, most people will say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I think I would. And then you ask the follow-up question, okay, if you stand before Jesus Christ and he should ask, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And so it's at that point that you begin to understand what their definition of Christian is. If they offer any type of answer other than, I place my faith in Christ, then you can simply ask kindly and respectfully, can I share with you what the Bible says about salvation? And that's what I want to do with you this evening. Is our salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Is Jesus enough? Well, man, from the beginning of the church, uh, the history of the New Testament church, 
Satan, he could not do anything uh, to prevent Jesus from <clears throat> dying and rising again, even though he tempted him to do it there in the temptation narratives in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. He couldn't do it. And so Satan is a smooth operator. Uh, the gospel is ours now, a uh, free gift through Jesus Christ. So what Satan did was said, okay, I couldn't stop it from coming. What I can do, though, is confuse the people about what it means. And so Paul had shared with the Galatians, he had taught the uh, Galatians what it means to follow Jesus Christ. But false teachers slithered their way in, posing as followers of Jesus, and began to preach a different gospel. Look what Paul said to the Galatians. He was not gentle. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched or cast a spell on you? I'm reading from Galatians 3, verses 1 through 3. He said, for the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Apparently, Paul made it very clear as to what the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ meant for you and me and means for you and me. He continues, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? In other words, through human effort? Of course not, exclamation point. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. And he says, man, how foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? He continues in verses 6 and 7. He says, look, man, man, I'm blown away. I, I, I. He says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. There's no good news in continuing to have to check off the boxes, man. And he finishes up by saying, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Well, what do I mean by salvation by works? Because that's what they had become, um, or they had begun to believe again as these false teachers had come in and began to try to once again enslave them to trying to be good enough. Salvation by works is simply, I can and must earn my salvation by human effort. When I stand before Christ, the, the question is typically, will my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds? It's checking off the boxes. <laughs> Even the Baptist church, man, I, I know you remember these, um, uh, these envelopes, remember? I mean, you know, look what it has here. Uh, did you attend Sunday school? Did you bring your Bible? Did you study your lesson? Are you giving? Did you attend big church? Did you read your Bible daily? How many visits did you make? And who else have you contacted? This is literally checking off the boxes. Now we know what the purpose of this was. It was just to maybe pro to provide some accountability. <clears throat> But for the average person in the pew, do you know what they think? Oh my goodness. The guy next to me, Bob here, he checked off eight boxes. And then um, <clears throat> Dean, he didn't check off any. You know, and so then all of a sudden you, 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 you tend to rate yourself in God's sight as how many boxes I've checked off. This if I'm good enough mentality is hardwired into our psyche, right? From childhood, if you clean your room, you won't get in trouble. Excel in school, you just might get into the college you want. You work hard, and you might get that raise or promotion. Satan knows this, and he capitalizes on it. This is precisely why he works so hard to associate earthly work, earthly works with human effort. Um, there was a poll published by the Southern Baptist Convention uh, 22 years ago which is recent within the span of history. But what they found out was absolutely alarming. Now, these are Southern Baptists. Uh, in other words, these are not people who identify as Christians. These are those who identify as people of the book. 
57% believed works play a part in salvation. Folks, that's six out of 10. That's the majority of people who fill our pews every day, every Sunday rather, believe in some way I have to help myself get to heaven. Truth be told, when weighed against human intellect, logic, and reason, this pattern makes sense. It's because it's uh, the world we live in. So it's no wonder that the Galatians and many since the first century have, quote, so quickly, end quote, succumb to this bondage. But aren't you glad God doesn't work according to human intellect, logic, and reason? Because of his role in the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther wrote a powerful commentary on Paul's letter to the Galatians. Here's what he wrote. He said, people have seemed to be possessed with devils, but now the devils themselves, themselves seem to be possessed with far worse devils who work tirelessly to muddy the waters of the truth of the gospel, which is made available to all by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And then look how he finishes. So deeply rooted in us is this evil desire to earn our salvation. Let's look at the Mormons for a minute. Now again, to all my Mormon friends, disagreement does not mean hate. But let me use them as an example. I could use the Jehovah's Witnesses um, as well. Uh, I have a Book of Mormon in my office. I'll read through it every now and then. In 2 Nephi 25, 23, it says, For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. A half truth is still a whole lie, folks. Let's look at that, um, the devil's math. I don't know where I got this. It was a long time ago. I can't remember if, if I was a student and my youth pastor taught this or if I was at a conference and some speaker taught it, but I've never forgotten it. The devil's math. The devil adds extra biblical sources of authority. What do I mean by extra biblical? Outside of the Bible. The Mormons have four sources of their own authority. The devil subtracts from the person and work of Christ. In other words, Jesus is not enough. Number three, look at that. He multiplies the requirements for salvation. And number four, he divides your loyalty from God in Christ by emphasizing the importance of another religious figure. Within the Mormon church, they have the prophet who's in Salt Lake City. He can change any word he desires on any source, authoritative source they have. We do not as evangelical Christians. So let's look at the Mormon Book of Mormon compared to the Bible. We just read 2 Nephi. Um, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Boy, that tramples the cross of Christ. Paul wrote, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Um, it goes on in 2 Nephi. And notwithstanding, this is 2 Nephi 25, verses 24 and 30. And notwithstanding, we believe in Christ. We keep the law of Moses and look forward with steadfastness unto Christ until the law shall be fulfilled. So that day's not come yet, in their opinion. And inasmuch as it shall be expedient, ye must keep the performances and ordinances of God until the laws shall be fulfilled, which was given to Moses. Just reading that, I can feel the weight of bondage upon me. When I ran down those two Mormon missionaries right out here, Bless their hearts, they weren't even on bikes, so they couldn't get away from me. That must have looked terrifying. This old guy, I mean, it must have been 10 years ago, but, you know, even then I was 
probably close to 50. And here I go darting out of the church. And of course, you know, they're, they're often treated so disrespectfully and, and hatefully. And here I come running at them. And they did. Their eyes got as big as silver dollars. And uh, I told them I just wanted to ask some questions. I said, y'all want to come in? And they said, we're not allowed to. Not allowed to come in uh, to an evangelical church. Um, and so I said, well, what about it's when Wendy's was over here? Well, we just go over there. So we hopped in my car and drove over there. I had a Dr. Pepper. They had Sprite because they can't have caffeine. <clears throat> and so I just asked them several questions. And um, two things um, stuck out to me. One, their answers sounded right. They used the same terminology as evangelical Christianity, as biblical Christianity, but their definitions were completely different. Second, they did try to convert me. And I got to hand it to them. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do, right? And so I kind of listened to them. I, I made it clear that we're not, they're not going to be able to convert me because I absolutely disagreed uh, with their doctrines. However, um, they said, well, we'd like for you to look over. And they started handing me these pamphlets, rules to keep, boxes to check off. And I walked out of there just thinking, oh, those poor guys. I mean, they're, they're guys, they're people. And my heart broke for them because I could sense in a fresh way the burden they're carrying. Well, look what Jesus said about the law that the uh, Mormons say that we should continue to keep because it has yet to be fulfilled. Jesus said, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. In John 19, 30, when Jesus received the sour wine on the cross, he said, it is finished. Tell telestai, it is finished. What that means, it is to bring to a close, to finish, to end. Past, finished, past tense. Executed, completed, fulfilled, paid in full. Am I right about it? Listen, there's no, it's not necessary for you and I to try to check off a bunch of boxes to try to look good in God's sight. It's impossible, man. There's no way. It's a hill with no top on it. We'll be climbing it the rest of our lives and we'll never reach the top. Again, Martin Luther uh, on his commentary, commentary on Galatians 2.20. Paul, that's when he wrote, for to me to live is Christ, to die is, I'm sorry, pardon. <clears throat> I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Freedom. So, commentate, comment, commenting on that passage, Luther said, therefore, just as Christ himself was crucified to the law, sin, death, and the devil, so that they have no further power over him, so also, now that I through faith have been crucified with Christ in spirit, I have been crucified and am dead to the law, sin, death, and the devil, so that they have no further power over me. He finishes the law, provides for us knowledge of our sin. But as Paul wrote later on, Christ is the end of the law. Now the Mormons and other uh, religions like that, they can't get around this, and that's why they have to write literature other than the Bible. Luther said the glory and ambition of the false prophets is so dangerous <clears throat> So dangerous a poison that I wish it buried in hell, for it is the cause of many people's destruction. Oh, I don't know if you know people who are so crippled with back-breaking burdens of trying to just check off the boxes. If I do enough, God will love me. It is bondage. And you know what? What if you begin to fall behind? Because, I mean, this is a matter of checking off every box every day, every minute of every day, knowing you didn't get them checked off, all of them, and then getting up and starting over the next day. It's, that, was the whole, that was the whole purpose of the Old Testament law, man. It wasn't to, to, to bridge the gap. The cross did that. It was to serve as a reflection, a high-powered mirror 
so that we look into it and go, oh man, I do not measure up. I can't measure up. So all of a sudden we get burdened, right? I mean, it's a burden we can't. I mean, if we have a bad day, and then what if we have a really, really bad day? <laughs> it's more like that, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, there's, it's just backbreaking. And all, also, what an absolutely miserable way to exist where salvation is concerned. Not to mention terrifying, because what if I die and I haven't finished checking off the list, man? 31, 33, 39, 28, 17. That, those are not the lottery numbers. These are the ages of people who died in auto accidents in a two weeks period of time. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. Are you ready for eternity? The only way you can is by faith in Jesus Christ. You may be only to box number two and then meet your death. Salvation by works or human effort is nothing but bondage. Jesus announced in John 8, 32 through 34, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you what? Free. And so the Jews, they answered him, said, we're offspring of Abraham. We've never been slave to anyone. <clears throat> How is it that you say you'll become free? Jesus said, man, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now, there are those who go, man, I don't practice sin. Sin doesn't have to be an ingrained habit. <clears throat> It doesn't have to be an addiction. We're all cursed with a natural desire to sin, every last one of us. The way I like to describe that is no one <clears throat> had to teach us how to lie, how to be stingy, how to be angry, how to hate. It all came naturally. And that's why Paul said in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is the bad news that precedes the good news. Talking about freedom, Paul wrote to the Galatians, he said in chapter 2, 4, and then 5, 1, he said this matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So is human effort or any sort required for salvation? Is Jesus enough? Well, let's settle the matter by allowing God to answer the question himself. <clears throat> Jesus said in Luke 7, 50, to the woman, he said, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. In Acts 16, 29 through 31, Paul and Silas in jail for preaching Christ. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. In Romans 10, Verses 9 through 13, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Look what Jesus said here in John 6, 29. This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Probably the first verse many of us ever memorized. For God so loved the world, John wrote in chapter 3, verse 16, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And again, we go back to Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, where Paul said, we know that a person is not justified. That word justified is a big theological term, which means simply just if. I'd never sinned. 100% holy. 100% righteous. I've told you before, if you were to stand before God right now, considering the thoughts and actions that we've done in the last several days, no telling what we've said or thought, right? But if you stood, if we stood before this mighty, holy judge right now, he would see you as 100% righteous. 
and 100% holy. Not because of something we've done, but because of what Christ did. Paul wrote, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Boy, can it get any more contrary to the Book of Mormon? Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So the bottom line, folks, according to God himself, Jesus is enough. Now, there is another denomination, an evangelical Protestant denomination, um, that will still teach that baptism is necessary um, for salvation. I respect them. I respectfully disagree with them. As I have had conversations before, um, one of the arguments is that for instance, the thief on the cross. Uh, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And uh, the debate begins with, well, Jesus didn't take this thief off the cross, take him down and baptize him so that he could be in heaven that day. And they counter with, well, Jesus had not died yet. The gospel was not complete yet, so forth and so on. Well, first of all, I want you to look at what I just read to you. Paul wrote this, uh, this promise to the Galatians decades after the thief on the cross, well after Jesus died and rose from the tomb. In addition, he wrote to Titus decades after the thief on the cross. He said, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. By the way, baptism is vitally important. We are commanded to repent and be baptized. Baptism, though, is an outward picture of an inward change. The water doesn't save us. It makes us wet. But it is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is our public profession of faith. So please don't misinterpret or misunderstand that I am minimizing its importance. It simply is not required. No amount of human effort is required for salvation. The same words Jesus gave that thief today because of your repentance, because of your belief and faith. Today, now, you will be with me in paradise. The message has not changed. One Puritan prayer said, Oh my God, I bid farewell to sin by clinging to the cross, hiding in Christ's wounds and sheltering in his side. The song we sing sometimes before the throne of God above. I love this second <clears throat> verse. When Satan tempts me to despair and he tells me of the guilt within, all the guilt because I just can't check off those boxes. Look at me, I am unworthy and gross and filthy and dirty. He says, upward I look and I see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul now is counted free. For God the just is satisfied, look at this, to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. It's what Paul meant when he wrote, he who knew no sin became our sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Am I right about it? Amen. So Tim Keller, <clears throat> I call him a modern day C.S. Lewis, pastor of the Redeemer Church in New York City. This is fantastic. He said, this is the gospel. I am so flawed <clears throat> that Jesus had to die for me. Yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. The only unpardonable sin is unbelief. The only human effort, for lack of a better phrase, required 
is simple belief, simple faith. No checking off of any boxes. You know why? Jesus checked them all off for us. He paid a debt I did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sin away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid that debt that I could never pay, man. I got a bill in the no, I got a check in the mail. <laughs> wow. From a doctor. <clears throat> How often does that happen? You know why? Because I had continued to pay on a bill that was already paid. And that's what works-based salvation is. It's continuing to foolishly pay on a bill that was already paid in full, man. It's foolishness. And it nullifies the cross. Jesus either died for all sin or no sin. <clears throat> the cross is either 100% sufficient or 100% deficient. Jesus is enough. If you're here and you never placed your faith in Christ, if you're watching online and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, then I would ask you to consider laying down your burden of trying to be good enough. Lay your burden down and place it at the feet of Jesus. Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he said, there's nothing we can do to make God love us anymore and there's nothing we can do to make God love us any less. No, God's love for us is inexorably fixed based on the work of Christ on the cross. Speaking of that thief, we're gonna kind of focus on him as we close. Yancey went on to say, he said, Jesus forgave a thief dangling on a cross, knowing full well the thief had converted out of plain fear. That thief would never study the Bible, never attend synagogue or church, and never make amends to those he had wronged. He simply said, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus promised today you will be with me in paradise. It was another shocking reminder that grace does not depend on what we have done for God, but rather what God has done for us. So, <clears throat> Alistair Begg pastors a church in Cleveland, Ohio. He is Scottish, so it's kind of fun to listen to him preach. This is about a minute and a half video clip it is powerful. Let's watch it together. Without the preaching of the cross, without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very quickly revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. So that to go to the old uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. And think about the thief on the cross. And what an immense, I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you were, you were, you were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You'd never been in a Bible study. You'd never got baptized. You never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and yet, and yet, you made it! You made it! How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because like, I don't know. Well, 
you know, we, uh, did, excuse me, let me get my supervisor. They go get the supervisor ready. So we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you, are you, are you, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? I said, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, about, let's just go to the doctrine of scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually in frustration, he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I think God. Now, now, that's the, that is the only answer. That is... When we stand before a holy and terrifying God, the one true judge, more aware of our unworthiness than we have ever, ever been. And if he should say, why should I allow you into heaven? we could say the man on the middle cross said I could come. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, Jesus is enough. Let's pray. God, Lord, I am in absolute awe as I continue to understand and will continue to try to understand for the rest of my life that you did everything. I did nothing. I deserve hell, you gave me heaven. I deserve pain, you gave me life. I deserve despair, you gave me hope. And that when you were on the cross, I was on your mind. And I, I thank you, God, Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for coming, folks. We'll see you next week.